California down to Santa Maria, which is where Vandenberg Air Force Base was, with a 300 baud modem, and and we were all ecstatic that the that the whole <laughs> that the whole communication took place. Um, it's it's come a long way since then. Um, it sure has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really has. And here we are, yeah. taking advantage. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, our fearful leader has shown up. <laughs> hey, Marco. Hello. Let me make sure that I'm set up. <laughs> I'm a bit in transition because I just got back from my from a preschool uh, that we're, we're thinking of sending or we're planning uh-huh. our younger daughter. And after that, we were all hungry, so we grabbed a bite. And how did it go? Yeah, no. we we've been there um, a number of years ago because our older daughter was there, and I think it went well. I think that um, I didn't find anything to be concerned about. Uh, they seem to have things under control and have their research and evidence based approaches, and uh, seem to be attentive and attuned to the children as well. Uh, so. It, I think it'll work out there. It was good for our older daughter. Even though we're, we're homeschooling her now, uh, we we sent her to preschool there in kindergarten. Mm. So she got some one foot in that world. So she's joining the consensus reality. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I know. My, uh, my grandson goes to a, a daycare here and uh, not far from us. It's a whole other reality. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's consensus or not, it's, but it's a, it's its own little world. I can, I can assure you that, but he likes it. Cool. TJ. Hey TJ. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. It's always good to hear. Yeah. Are you, so you are, uh, did you leave work early to join us? No, I'm on vacation this week. Oh, okay. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll be here Thursday too, I hope. That's <laughs> vacation? Boy. Vacation, imagine that. <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> right? That's one of the things I miss about not working, you know. Yeah. Not getting a vacation. <laughs> probably busier now than ever right <laughs> well, i am i have no absolutely zero time this is the whole thing i don't even... uh, uh. um it's about five after should we wait a minute another minute i don't know if doug's going to join us he said i don't think he said he we were going to yeah he, he didn't think he didn't seem to be able able to at this time yeah mm-hmm. And I don't think anybody else will 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 be here, so uh, we could get started for sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just before we start, I want to thank you, Marco. I dropped some uh, birthday hints, and I got it. Cool. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> awesome! Awesome collection of stuff. <laughs> Talking about synchronicity. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's something musical about it, and maybe we can talk about that, too. The the poetics of synchronicity, perhaps. Absolutely. Sure. And, and John, you suggested the text that we read today. I did. We also had some seed questions and background reading and other input stuff in the forum. Right. And so I'll let you lead us off if you'd like to begin. Okay, thank you. I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm really, um, I've been going through lots of different books and, you know, extracting certain um, anecdotes and stories. And um, I posted that, that article by Eric Weiss about definitions for synchronicity Mm -hmm. and um, how um, perplexing it is for us moderns to deal with uh, something that emerged out of the magical. And, um, I also reviewed uh, the, um, the dialogue with Garfield and Carrie Welch. And she said something, listening to it again, I, more things popped out. She said, um, she talks about pink noise mm. and um, how pink noise produces order and disorder. And so 
that's what I would like to do. I would like to create some pink noise. Um, she also talks about each person lives in their own reality. And then there's the consensus reality. But that's not the reality they live in. I thought that was very interesting, listening to that again. And we've all shared it and we've discussed it somewhat. So I want to elaborate a little bit on some of these themes. And I want to share a few anecdotes, um, you know, gleaned from the vast literature. And I wanted to actually do some modeling to work on our individual maps of time. And that would be structured. I would ask a few questions from each of you. And then we could create a map. Each of you can create a map of, uh, of time. And then hopefully we can reflect a little bit on a possible meta map. Uh, this is very ambitious and it is an experiment. I've never quite done anything like this before, um, but I think it might be of, of use to us as we um, are exploring synchronicity and serendipity and finding new definitions. Um, I think we need to also have an experiential component to all of this. Um, Doug, uh, Doug posted something about, um, he asked about, are there any updates for Jung's model or upgrades for Jung's model? And that's what I'm hoping we'll do today. I hope we can upgrade. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with just making a few, uh, a few uh, remarks and some anecdotes. Um, about what synchronicity could be or what serendipity is. Um, and then um, uh, like we can do like an open frame, have a free for all. And you know, uh, each of you can express whatever you want to about this topic. And then maybe we can uh, have that structured part I mentioned where we work on, a, on an actual map, do some actual modeling, take about 20 minutes. I think there are three of us on this call besides myself and so, I think it would take about 20, 25 minutes. And then we could spend the rest of the call doing a free for all again, reflecting upon this experience. So are you, you guys all with me? <laughs> Works for me. Okay, thank you for your attention. Um, I just wanted to start with, this is from Alan Combs and Mark Holland's book synchronicity. And I think all of you, uh, since you're all scholars here, uh, would relate to this uh, concept that author Kessler came up with called the library angel. An excellent example of the angel at work was reported to Kessler in 1972 by Dame Rebecca West, who was researching a specific episode that took place during the Nuremberg war crimes war crime trials. And this is a quote from Rebecca West. I looked at the trials in the library and was horrified to find they published in a form almost useless to the researcher. They are abstracts and are cataloged under arbitrary headings. After hours of search, I went along the line of shelves to an assistant librarian and said, I can't find it. There's no clue. It may be in any of these volumes. I put my hand on one volume and took it out and carelessly looked at it. It was not only the right volume, but I had opened it at the right page. <clears throat> I think that's extremely amusing. I'm sure, I think, Ed, you were talking about this uh, experience quite common to you. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to, uh, another quotation, another anecdote from a, another interesting book called Extraordinary Knowing. This is by Elizabeth Lloyd Mayer. Um, science, skepticism, and the inexplicable powers of the mind. She was a psychotherapist, um, and she had a lot of interesting clients. And this is a, a description that one of her clients had. Um, I know things, and it mystifies me how I know them. Sometimes it terrifies me. It starts with the getting a good read on things. I'm intuitive, but lots of people are intuitive. It didn't get really scary until I was in graduate school. I was in my third year of PhD work. I had a good fellowship. My professors thought well of me. 
I had an area for dissertation that built on the work of one professor, someone I liked a lot, very smart, but very gruff. He was teaching a seminar. One day he'd given us a problem to work out, very complicated. I took it down like everyone else. Then I said the answer, just said it, the right answer, to four decimal places. It just came to me. It just seemed natural to say it. It was a disaster. The professor swore I must have stolen his notes. That was crazy. There was no way I could have gotten those notes, but it was just as crazy that I came up with the answer. After that, he wouldn't work with me anymore. The other students stopped trusting me. It got so bad I had to find another university where I could do my dissertation research. I've been moving ever since. I get afraid people might start attacking me for things that I shouldn't know. Now I move before things blow up. What happens is I'll suddenly know something, like I'll know an experiment won't work. I'll know some data analysis is faulty. The more I let on what I know, the more obvious it gets that I don't have any basis for knowing. It's just an idea that comes to me, but I know. I can't tell how powerful the sensation is. Maybe you know what it's like. It's spooky. It scares me. I want to be normal. So I want to be normal. <laughs> I think everyone wants to be normal. Um, I think we have a very dear, a dear a kind of deep fear about being too weird or, or too deviant um, for the consensus reality. So we have to keep it in check. But as we've been discussing this, uh, this mental, mental deficient phase and looking at Gebser um, and um, the integral, whatever that could be, and this ability to um, harmonize these uh, brain waves, the, e e the EEG, um, I think Kerry was mapping across from the, the Gebser's model to um, the EEG. EEG. Mm. I think that's very suggestive of how we might start playing around with um, models for serendipity and synchronicity, um, what these odd kinds of, um, so Jung talks about an a-causal uh, connecting principle. Um, but as um, Eric Weiss says in that essay, that's not very satisfying. It sort of sounds good, but it pretty much says nothing at all. It's a, it's a tricky way for the modern mind to sort of obfuscate um, what these, uh, these kinds of experiences could possibly come from. So I'm, um, I'm open to any feedback. Um, there are a few more stories that I think might be of use. Um, but I'm also interested in, in what you guys are coming up with. One more quote. Uh, also, I've been using synchronicity and serendipity uh, almost synonymously. I've been oscillating back and forth on these uh, two concepts. Um, I think they, there are slight differences, and I think um, maybe we'll uh, elaborate on what that those differences could be. But I think um, Talib Kalib, I think that's his name, Nassim Talib Kalib, who wrote The Black Swan, mm. he's, he speaks about serendipity a lot. It's sort of accidental learning, but some of that learning isn't necessarily accidental. Um, and he speaks of, if you think that the inventions we see around us came from sitting in a cubicle and concocting them according to a timetable, think again. Almost everything of the moment is the product of serendipity. And he lists whole, whole lots of inventions, from, from penicillin to Velcro, which came out of uh, what he calls serendipity. So, um, who wants to start first? I just sort of, I just want to open this up um, to have like a, a free for, a, what, do, what do you call it, Ed? Uh, it's um, not a free for all, but Brainstorm. all over the place. We can go all over. <laughs> 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 we can go all over the place uh, for, you know, as long as we need to. And mm -hmm. then I can do a, a kind of structured, uh, formal uh, activity for all of us. And it's a, a group activity. It's, you'll be asked as an individual about your map of time. I'll ask you a few uh, questions. And then I think we can each uh, take a step back and reflect upon our different maps. Mm. And then we can have another free-for-all. 
So it's a, it's free for all, uh, all over the place, some structure, and then all over the place. That's sort of my my uh, plan. But we'll see what happens, and hopefully at the end of the um, our call today, we can update um, ourselves. And um, it would be my I would be delighted if some serendipitous learnings happened mm -hmm. in this session today. Let's so let me, let me. I I know that they will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they always do, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Were, can I uh, say something here right off the bat? Uh, one of the one of the things that struck me about uh, when I first started reading Eric's paper here, um, as you as you all know, I have I have a problem with modernity and postmodernity, and I don't know what else I all have a problem with. But it, it took me a while to realize that he wasn't talking to me when he was writing this. And I always read this as if the, the, whoever's writing it was is speaking to me. And then I realized, well, he's not speaking to me because I don't have this, this view of the world that, that he's cautioning us about at the beginning, this modern view that is so, so absolutely um, at, at base materialistic that it doesn't allow for these other things. I, I come from a very different, you know, my, my history has been, been much different than that. And so I don't, I don't see the world that way. And but once I realized that I said, Oh, okay, well, this is, this is fine because it's like you said in your second antidote, you can say things and do things. I mean, my, my antidotes about books falling off of shelves and bookstores. Um, I know what it's like to instill fear in your, in your co-conversationalists. You say something like that and, and terror enters into people's eyes because that cannot be. You're making this up. This is just a story. Well, of course it's a story, but I'm not making it up. You see, my whole feeling is that good stories, you can't make up. You know, the best ones happen and, and you see them. You know, reality is much stranger than fiction. Fiction is always the controlled attempt to kind of come to terms with things. Uh, that's how I see it anyhow. So when, so when I'm going through here, I realize, well, that, that's all well and good unless, for example, you're Arthur Young. And, and when, you, when, when you think about Young, obviously, Weiss and Young didn't have any, any real interaction. But if you start with the whole idea that light is conscious and purposeful, then you, you get to serendipitous places very, very quickly. Um, you get to things that are synchronistic very, very quickly because they actually can't be otherwise. Now, one of the things that out of science that probably has impressed me or stuck with me or made, you know, one of the, the hardest hits on, on me overall has been Bell's theorem. That's, and, and it has been proved in the meantime, and that is non-locality. Two, two particles that were once related that are now separated, it doesn't matter. They can be on other sides of the universe, and if something happens to one, it happens to the other. There's, there's just effect over space, if you want to look at it that way, uh, in zero time. And if you couple a thought like that, well, it's more than a thought. It's actually a, a theorem. But if you couple with it the idea that, like um, Carl Sagan said, you know, we're made of star stuff, uh, the, the Big Bang and all those particles out there. Well, then every, every particle in my body has been somewhere else at some other time. I'm, I'm connected with all. If I take that seriously, which I do, then, then I'm constantly being affected by things that I have absolutely no relation, conscious relation to. And you, that, can either, that can either scare you, which it does a lot of people, or it can comfort you, which it does me. Because it's like, well, okay, I'm literally never alone, even though sometimes I would like to be. But then again, the, the, the imp in me always says, but if I'm affecting myself, I could be wreaking havoc elsewhere as well. You know, this is, this is not a one-sided thing. <laughs> so, you know, we're all, we're all involved in this, uh, in this together. So I, I never had that problem, if you will, it's in, in, in quotes, that, that needs to be mad, that it can't be part, it's all part of my world and I consider myself 
here currently 2017 in a modern world. Not in the modern world in the sense that he's talking about with this materialistic bent, but the moment you give that up, and the moment you acknowledge that maybe there is something, a, a more, maybe there is a spiritual, or maybe it is just consciousness. And I use Justin in uh, quotation marks there. The once, once you open it up to there's a, a non-physical reality as well as a physical reality, then a lot of these things become very, very normal. And, and what surprises me is when it doesn't quite work that way. And when I'm, I'm off looking, I say, well, actually, something should have gone on here or something should have happened because that's what I would have expected. You develop a whole new expectation horizon, so to speak. And that was the thing that struck me that towards the end, it was like, well, okay. But in, even in a physics, physicist's view of the world, Young's, for example, all of this is very normal, which is why, why Young was not part of the mainstream, our everyday, well-accepted, uh, orthodox scientific community. And he was also looked at as at askance uh, and kept at a distance. But um, um, it, it is necessary, I think, to to ease a lot of people into this. You know? So those are my two cents. Great. Someone, I think it's Michael Murphy, who wrote Future of the Body. Yeah. He talks, he calls it metanormal rather than mm -hmm. paranormal. Yeah. Um, but I, I so agree that what's, what's normal and what's paranormal can vary from day to day and from person to person. Mm -hmm. And that the, what we may be calling paranormal now might be the new normal if enough people have them, had those kinds of experiences and naturalized them or, or made them palatable or had some sort of cognitive framework, mm -hmm. then they could um, probably expect to um, use them in a creative way. So thank you for that, Ed. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make one more comment because I think Doug uh, mentioned something about, he, he sent a, uh, I think Waking Life, he, yeah. a little bit from Waking Life, which yeah. is a movie I really enjoyed about a, a post postmodern couple. <laughs> but then, um, and I thought it was very amusing because the dialogue between the two sounded to me very much like um, what the modern mind does with the, the synchronistic or the magical. It tries to operationalize it. Mm. And I noticed that in myself. You know, these are great. Mm -hmm. I want more of them. I want, I want them to become more effective and efficient for me. Because <laughs> 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 if I can make this work, man. Uh, but it doesn't happen that way. I found mm -hmm. uh, lots of misfires and, and backfires. And a lot of these synchronistic events are, ser are definitely learnings, but they're not necessarily pleasant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can also create a lot of cognitive dissonance. So mm -hmm. thank you for... for uh, no, isn't that the, the the kind of the moral of the uh, the sorcerer's apprentice? <laughs> yes. I, I I'm an absolute Disney disliker, but I like that one. <laughs> that's a that's a, another cultural metaphor we can mark the sorcerer's apprentice. Yeah. Sorcerer's apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> I went in the macro social approach, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> I, I, like, I like where Eric Weiss went. I like where he ended up, actually, where he's replacing synchronicity with consciousness itself. Um, he distinguishes between the pre-modern and the modern and it's, it's, it's exactly what uh, Mercy Eliade did with the difference between the traditional man and the modern man. And the traditional man has, uh, the traditional man is operating out of the mythical circle, if you will, and the modern man is operating out of the mental arrow of time. So the traditional man puts hope in his sense meaning, making of the past by the renewal, the archetype always coming back. Um, the, you know, the king and the priestess go up into the upper chamber of the temple and the crops come back and, and you kind of wipe the slate clean every year. And uh, so that's the hope in the mythical circle. Then you, the hope in the um, mental arrow is, of course, the, well, it's really a myth, but progress. And you're accumulating knowledge and you're learning how to 
supposedly get better, avoid the mistakes that you make. You're in, in neither the circle nor the arrow are you carrying a weight of the disasters of the past. You're always putting it into a kind of meaning and, and sense-making um, schema for that. So Eliade says the traditional man has a terror of history. Um, history as what Toynbee would say is one damn thing after another. But mm -hmm. in order to get rid of the terror of history, he just goes in the cycle and renews it. Modern man, I would say, has a terror of mystery because your progress, in order to have progress, you have to be able to know that the patterns and the laws you're discovering as you're moving forward in time are working for you, that you can apply the lessons of one thing to the, to the next one and, and get somewhere. And if you take that certainty away, if you take that, turn the um, predictabilities back into probabilities, your meaning system collapses. And that's, what's, that's why it's the fear of synchronicity, you know, kind of strikes against all of that. Oh, you know, what do I do now type of thing. I just thought that was very interesting. It's the same. It's Gebser, Eliade, and Weiss here are saying the same things. And it's that, that switch back and forth even between the, the theological, for lack of better, and technological. So it's the fear of synchronicity and the, the terror of terror, mystery. Terror of, terror of mystery, which parallels oh. Eliade's terror of history in the traditional man. And, and terror of history in the traditional man, would that be because they're sort of fast forwarding into the historical modern and it's freaking them out? No, well, it, it, it's, it's an avoidance. He would say it's an avoidance of, of the weight of the disasters and disappointments of events. And if you don't have to carry that from year to year, if you can kind of renew it and come back and reinforce the legitimacy of the archetypes, you kind of get away oh, from that. I got you. Yeah. I, I, I misread you. I see what you're oh, talking no, about. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So TJ, you described a, a circle, the mythical, the mythical circle, an arrow, the arrow of time, the arrow of progress, the mythical circle corresponding to uh, what Gibson would call the mythic structure of consciousness, the modern arrow of time corresponding to what he would mental. call the mental. Uh, what's beyond that? In <laughs> <laughs> That's... The very interesting question that I've been kicking around. I just read a um, article online for about it was wasn't it wasn't Collingwood's stuff, but it was somebody who was writing an essay about R. G. Collingwood as a philosopher. Uh, I think he wrote the idea of history, mm. and the the question and my my whole theme has you know been about how do you use history but then kind of transcend it. According to Collingwood, a historian is forbidden to ask that question. He's dealing with the evidence from the past, and that's where his information comes from, and that's the scheme that he sets up. What is beyond that is not a historical question, according to Collingwood. But Spengler, Aurobindo, Gebser, all these guys are asking that very question, what comes next? Mm -hmm. So who, who said that history is a nightmare we're trying to wake up from? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> but it's sort of that how do we use history in order to transcend it? Pretty much. And you would say then that um, Aurobindo and Gebser and Bergson, and who's that other guy they always, that integralist that's so, um, Mir Eliade. So they're all working with this. They have a future orientation and sort of they can look into the past and in the future. Um, sort of at the same time, I'm looking at uh, Arthur Kester, wrote a book called Janus, talked mm -hmm. about the Janus-faced God who yeah. can look into the future and the past. The past at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that's another interesting metaphor. That, uh, yeah. But it, it's, consciousness, it's consciousness students who are doing that. It's not historians. historians mm -hmm. are, hi, history, history is a very mental structure thing. And then Gebser points it out, of course, the, the most directly, but it's kind of a theme in all of, in all of these readings. Um, history is for a people who have discovered chronology and causation and the need to arrange things in that spatial time grid, the need to spatialize time. Before that, you have, again, the myths, the archetypes. And before that, in the magical consciousness structure, you don't need, you're not dealing with past, present, future, or, or time like that. So you don't even need a, a sense of history in, in that sense. Uh, yeah, that's very helpful. And a cultural analyst, like you said, Gebser was sort of a hybrid, perhaps. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Without going into hero worship, because I just read that thread, you know, but uh, yeah, he, Gebser is calling us to incorporate, um, what did Ed say before, expectation horizon. He's broadening that. He's calling us to, to it, if we recognize the archaic spirit, let's say, as a, again, for lack of better word, as, a, as like a theological phase and then the magical structure would be a technological phase. Now I'm aware of nature and I've got to use these things and I'm going to kill these animals so that, you know, my villagers and children can live and make those kinds of covenants. Um, and then the mythical is another theological phase and the mental being another technological phase. And Gebs just kind of saying, instead of keep, it's not going with these waves, incorporate that. Mm -hmm. Use all the wisdom for that and, and go forward with that. Another thought, real quick, I'll throw this out. Um, because I've been reading also uh, Merlin Donald's Stages of Mind, which again kind of maps onto Gibbs. I, like, I like him a lot, Merlin yeah, Donald. Yeah, he's cool. is very interesting. Um, I can't imagine, if, if you look at it historically, I can't imagine the magical structure of consciousness, relatively speaking, lasting all that long. You have a mythical structure that uh, I think agrarian civilization gave a boost to, but I think it probably predates that. I think the fireside chats and the modeling and rehearsing of skills that you that you need to survive in the magical, I think those turn very quickly into the cosmologies of myth. Then you have this long mythical period. Then you have a mental structure. If we start from Petrarch on the mountain and go to Einsteinian relativity at, at the most, that's only 600 years. The mm -hmm. mythical structure is lasting at least tens of thousands of years before that. There's a hope then if, if we're ever if really going to efficiently incorporate all of that, that the integral can last indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Something Eric, I don't know, maybe it was Eric Weiss. Didn't he speak of Petrarch's experience on the mountaintop as a synchronistic kind of event? Sort of, um, he might have I don't capsulized know. No, the, modern, the waking in a, of the modern, being able to take perspective from that mountaintop. But there's Jeremy also mentions that in his, uh, also, I just wanted to point out Merlin, Merlin Donald, uh, you just mentioned him, TJ, and I'm not sure where he fits. Is he a, he's a biologist, right? Or is he an anthropologist? Or is he a historian? I don't know. Well, what I, psychologist, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's not, he's not, yeah. All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. He's an interdisciplinary studies, which is also good. <laughs> I, I, li I like to use the word transdisciplinary because it's there sounds you go. so much fancier. <laughs> But can, I, can I interject just one little thing? Please. Yes. Um, would you, would both of you guys please put all of those references that you've made in the wiki so that we can actually read them sometimes? My old ears don't get names properly. Do you remember all those? I can't, uh, I can't write fast enough. Just, just stack the books yeah, up I'll beside you when yeah. you're talking. <laughs> you know <what> <laughs> Some of them are online, though. <laughs> I don't want to hear about your personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, ma. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm obviously a, a, you know, a, bound, a bound guy here. So. <laughs> Mark, do, you <laughs> do you have any reflections to share with us or comments? Any summaries? <laughs> I, I don't. I, I'm, uh, I don't have a summary. I, I feel like there's not exactly one out there. I'm looking for some sense of a whole, though. Some sense of how these strands interconnect, how they might themselves be synchronous or synchronistic. I have to. I'm going to start with a personal reflection on the term because it kind of. It didn't come out of nowhere, but it wasn't on my radar. I don't really think about synchronicity very much. I haven't given it much thought. It hasn't been, as Eric Weiss put in his paper, a matter of concern. Mm -hmm. Not the label in any event, not the term itself. But now that since we were going to talk, since we were planning to talk about it today, I began thinking about it and read the paper, uh, read the various posts on the forum and, uh, and and things started coming to mind like just the act 
of holding a thought or holding an inquiry open uh, began to, in a sense, almost coalesce meaning around it. Uh, so I could begin to see interconnections between things that I've read, I've seen conversations I might have had a while ago, somebody who, may, who visited my house the other day. And that began to create a sense of synchronicity around the synchronicity. So a sort of meta synchronicity, but it was, it, it, it was, and it wasn't intentional, nor was it, um, nor was it something that just happened spontaneously without my involvement. So there was some uh, aspect, some role I had, I had to play in, in, it, in that experience uh, emerging, or at least kind of coming to the surface, if not really occurring in a sort of full blown way with you know, books falling off of shelves or, or, or what have you. Uh, we're, we're reading different thinkers. We have different conversations and threads going on. Part of what has been on my mind has been the upcoming uh, delve into uh, Sloterdijk's uh, second volume uh, in his Fears trilogy, uh, which is called Globes. And uh, without going all the way into that, uh, one thing I, I think might be relevant to this conversation is that, uh, you know, we discussed the, the idea or the, the meaning potentially of that metaphor of a sphere, of an, a globe or an orb or that round shape. I, I don't want to necessarily focus on, on that, but part of what I'm learning through this return to Sloterdijk and the process of grappling, you know, why am I reading this? What, what, do, I, what do I want to get out of it? If you... Um, how does it relate to everything else? Part of what I'm learning is that there is a, there is a matter there is a, an, a matter of concern that, that Sloterdijk is focusing on, which he port- he's discussing in terms of these spherical shapes, but can be looked at in, in a way that doesn't rely upon the geometry necessarily that particular um, you know form, and that's that. And we'll talk, I'm sure, about this uh, on Thursday, is that the, the matter of concern is the whole. It's the world as a whole or life as a whole, reality as a whole. There's some um, attempt in the history of Western metaphysics as Sloterdijk is looking into it. But really, we could look at this also from the, the, the mythological perspective, that idea of a magic cir- uh, of a circle. Uh, and, and even the, the modern there's an attempt to relate to the whole, understand the whole, conceptualize the whole in the, in the history of Western metaphysics as Sloterdijk, I think is going to unpack it, control the whole, uh, there's a a motif of empire, of totalization, uh, and of using the powers that uh, are gained through our um, experiential learning, uh, through history, to, um, to, to, to not only enclose ourselves in a totality, but to transcend that totality at the same time. And this is kind of the weird thing that he starts to, to get into in terms of describing the contradictions, I think. And I don't know if he's going to use this term exactly, but let's say even just the internal uh, uh, conflicts in, in this project. So when I think about what the matter of concern is with synchronicity, it has something to do with the whole. It, it has something, some indica- there's some indication when a, when a synchronistic event happens that something bigger is happening than, than I'm aware of or able to conceptualize. Something bigger is making sense that transcends my horizon, my context of conception or understanding and that's part of i think what might be so terrifying to the you know mental the purely mental mind or the conventional mind or consensus reality mind at least in, relative to to our i think that's space. exact exact i think it's exact but, because it's it's either it either reinforces that worldview or it threatens it mm-hmm. so that sense that there's a horizon beyond your worldview is incredibly threatening, uh, particularly if that worldview is really wrapped up with your own sense of survival. Yeah. And 
so the way that we think the whole uh, is important, uh, and uh, and I think that the, the 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 notion that we use a particular spatial metaphor or temporal metaphors, and that these are not just w- ways that we kind of describe them theoretically after the fact, but they're constitutive in some way of our experience of the phenomena. That's something to pay attention to because that do, that's not like, a, like I think I've been saying on the forum or I've been trying to, like that's not representational. We're not just standing back as subjects creating a map of reality, the object to better use it. But we're looking in, looking pr- in the space prior to that, that conceptualization at the thing itself. <laughs> and so the the thing itself is i think what the ma- is the matter of concern uh and how we understand that that thing we can call it consciousness we can call it reality uh, you know there are many that's, those are, there are many discourses around around that that point of coalescence uh i think that's where synchronicity it, it, sort of comes into the picture. And I want to say one more thing about it. Um, I, I said at the outset that synchronicity it's, itself has not been a matter of concern, but rather the whole is a matter of concern. And I want to propose maybe a way of understanding synchronicity that would rem- maybe sort of include the mythological sense of uh, some kind of um, beings or some kind of forces, intelligences beyond our own that are conspiring to organize reality in a certain way. Then beyond, beyond then also the modern uh, denial of realities that are outside of its global uh, geometric, mathematical, scientific uh, worldview and ask whether or not we could look at synchronicity as something that's hap- that's very normal, that's happening all the time. Like it's happening in an atom, it's happening in a uh, social organization, it's happening in our brains, it's happening uh, in certainly cultural productions, art, music, scientific discoveries. I mean, there always has to be some uh, coming together of entities, patterns into greater wholes. So if it's happening all the time, but then we have these special experiences where it seems to happen in a way that transcends what we understand to be normal, what if that's just an aspect of a larger reality, a more whole reality, a higher level whole on to use Kessler's uh, term, which Wilbur also picks up on, that we're getting a, a, a glimpse into so we're getting a view of a, of, a, of a larger whole that's working together synchronistically uh, with correspondences in time and space and maybe just tr- even beyond the arrow of time so that we would have to understand time differently to understand how sy- a synchronistic event is actually normal from the perspective of a, a, a post, postmodern um, or integral worldview. Uh, so... I think that's may, may or may not lead to a particular you know path uh, for the conversation, or uh, just kind of add to the to the to the everywhere all over the place. Um, but that's how I'm relating to it at, at this. Um, point. I I can I wanted to respond to that. You're talking about the part and the whole, and we've been playing around with fractals, and it seems to me that the fractal sort of emphasizes that the whole reiterates in the part. And I think that's another metaphor we can put on the table, mm-hmm. uh, along with those topo-dimensional, uh, the limniscate, the Mobius strip, the Klein bottle. Uh, I just think it's fun for us to put out all these metaphors. And also, we can create other metaphors. Um, one of the books that I just comes to me that I think is uh, resonates with what you were just talking about is The Trickster and the Paranormal by George Hansen. And I think something that he, I just opened this up in the page I turned to, it talks about the middle area goes by several lab- labels, liminality, interstiality, 
Is that it? Interstitiality? I can't pronounce it. Oh. Transitional <laughs> space. Interstitiality? <laughs> yeah, just it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Transitional space. Betwixt and between. Anti structure. And he also talks about Aristotelian logic and the principle of identity and uh, the law of the excluded middle. Well, who made up this law anyway? <clears throat> and this is what I think the trickster challenges is um, uh, it, uh, it really upsets the apple cart. And something that you said, uh, Ed, last week, uh, something about the, there's the evolutionary, the developmental, and there's also the phasal. Mm -hmm. I thought that phasal part was very interesting um, and like frac uh, fractilic, mm -hmm. if that's a word. And I think what Carrie Welch is saying, if we, make this, if we, go, if we get finer and finer grain, uh, granularity, mm -hmm. um, then we start to tap into the, the, the timelessness. And what's before time is timelessness. And it's that um, oscillation, I think, that it's in those uh, in-betweens um, that you're seeing, that's where we find these synchronistic events often uh, appear, uh, these anomalies. Um, and this was really interesting for me. And I'm encouraged uh, because if it's okay with you guys, it's, uh, we're almost an hour into this call. Mm -hmm. If I could switch gears a little bit and put on my modeler's cap, um, I would like to start working with um, gathering some data from you guys. This is for my big ultimate research project, <laughs> qualitative research. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very attracted to a grounded action theory. There's, there's a problem in your community and you're a, a member of that community, you can, get, you can gather high quality data that isn't ad hoc or arbitrary, and that um, we can use that data to ground our theory. And this is uh, very important to me. It's, uh, I probably re repeated myself way too many times about how important it is to ground this stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'd like to... Um, Proceed further, unless there's some more comments out there that haven't been articulated yet that you want to toss in. How does everyone no, feel? No. That, that, that's fine. With, fine with me, John. And um, just one one small note. Sure. Uh, Marco was talking about that the hole, and and every time you you even remotely tap into it. It, there's this numinous experience. You realize that there's something that's so much bigger than me that it is very intimidating. And if you if you do that temporarily, that that wholeness becomes infinity. And there's a very interesting book um, on on mathematicians that that make that their their focus of study, and almost all of them go insane. Yeah, Cantor. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's a classic example of this. I'll, I'll, I'll take that out. Pick it up on the. Uh, go down. Go down. Uh, go down. Starved himself. To yeah, yeah, yeah. They all, yeah, they all, they all just loot. You lose it. You Is this know? a warning? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it points to. It points to the importance of. It points to the importance of filters. But go ahead. Yes. Ed. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. 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 So it, it's it's. There is there is something very real about that. There is something very existential about that. There's something very serious about that. And and as long as you know we're always aware, um, and I think that's why I think Marco's point is so 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 well taken. Synchronicity does have to do with that whole. It's the little. It's a little glimpse of something huge that's beyond it that I don't really necessarily want to deal with right now. You know, this is you know we're we're talking about something that's much bigger than just fits into our head. This is why, and I think this is true of all people, anybody that has a very strong belief system, fundamentalist Christians, for example, always tell you what God's thinking. You know, If they ever even came close to intuiting what God might be, their heads would explode, You know, because it's, it doesn't fit in there. You can't get it in your skull. And it becomes very, and that is the other side of, 
a lot of tales that are told in that direction that we might read in places and things like that. But it's a very, it's a very real thing. It's a very serious thing. And I think that's something we all need to always be aware of that, you know, it, we, we may have a lot of fun gallivanting out towards the edge to see what's over there, but <laughs> there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily going to come holding hands with us as we skip up to the abyss, you know? <laughs> that's the difference Cantor said between absolute infinity an actual infinity. Infinity, yeah. yeah. Among yeah. other things. One infin- infinity out there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'll have to dig that out. So I'll I'll put that on the list. Too. Fascinating. Um, I'm. I just before we start this process, I think it'll be like five minutes each person, and the total would be about 20, 20 minutes. And I think it's really in this kind of process, there's something useful about listening to another person's process. I, and I've done this with Ed and Marco. Mm-hmm. We've had several sessions using clean language. I don't think T, TJ, I, I've inquired about certain processes uh, online a little bit. Right. But this will be like uh, doing it live, which is a challenge for me um, because I have the benefit of verbal and nonverbal because I can see you guys. And um, so I want to ask you if you have any question for me about this process before we begin. I, I do, John. So would the desired outcome uh, be uh, to come to some kind of meta model of time drawing from our individual models of time? Is that what you're looking to? I don't, um, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to ask you for a desired outcome, <clears throat> but if you have one, that's cool. Um, I could, would you like me to do that? I mean, I was asking if that was yours. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very interested in, well, first of all, the issue, which is clarifying synchronicity. Um, And what could that, what could that be for us? Um, That would be, and what I would like for the group would be um, a very rich learning experience that will be of use and delight to you. And that's what I want for myself as well. So I I know what I want. I want a really rich learning experience and I want each of you to have a rich learning experience. And I believe modeling is a way of creating the conditions whereby that can happen. And I believe serendipity and synchronicity are um, often accompanying or you know, these rich learning experiences. So getting clearer um, and also accepting how fuzzy it all is is a great interest to me. And I also believe our civilization, Gandhi, I think, said, what, would, someone said, what do you think about civilization? And he said, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> so I don't think we've quite arrived yet at civilization. <laughs> but I think if we do, it will be because there were enough people who cared enough about um, these shared communal um, uh, events like ours that could stimulate these uh, serendipities. These, uh, so we can go into the crack in the cosmic egg and we can come back and reorient ourselves in a consensus reality and share something that's useful. Uh, I know I'm not wanting to get too caught up in the hero with a thousand faces, because I know that a lot of feminists um, are very suspicious of the hero's journey. But I still want a hero's journey. (laughs) There's a part of me that's still into that. So uh, is there anything else anyone wants to ask me about this process before we begin? Hmm. Okay. Ed, ready? Hmm. Okay. Marco, is it okay if we start with you? Sure. Um, before we do that, before we do this, I just wanted to tell you something that's coming to me. I had a experience. Um, th- the first uh, audition I went to in New York, I was very nervous. You know, there were like 200 people auditioning that day. I just, and I remember getting up there to do my piece. And um, the assistant director, he said, oh, didn't you play Oedipus in uh, a production in Houston? 
Houston, Texas, about two years ago? I said, yes, I did. They said, oh, you were very good in that. <laughs> wow, this is great. My first edition in New York, and someone already knows my work. Uh, mm-hmm. Who could have arranged that, right? And um, I, I got an offer. It was a part that I didn't want. And I said, well, I could take the part and be thankful. Probably other parts might come. Or I could hang out and wait. I went to another audition, so I refused the role. And then I went to another audition, and the um, there was a young woman, an actress, who uh, she wanted to go in front of me because she had she was in, in trouble with another director, and she needed to hurry this up. So I said, "Oh sure, go ahead." And she went ahead of me, and then um, then I did my audition, and I won that role. It wasn't the role I wanted, but I got it, a good one. And that later I got to talk to the director and we were, we were hanging out, having cocktails after the cast party, whatever. And she said, and we were talking about my audition. She says, well, your audition was pretty good, but that's not why I hired you. And I said, why did you hire me then? She said, because you were so nice to that bitch. <laughs> and I thought, wow. If I thought I was really hot stuff, I just realized I was so nice about the gym with you. <laughs> I got synchronicity that. meets chivalry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like these these synchronistic events happen, but they don't tell you what to do with them. You still mm-hmm. have to figure it out. What what the, what this here's a sign. Now what do I do with it? But I got the part of Horatio. Um, forgive me for me being a little too uh, long winded here and a little too theatrical, but I have to quote Hamlet. Uh, I didn't get it, again didn't get to play Hamlet, but I played a great role, Horatio who's Hamlet's best friend and is a very beloved uh, character in that play because everyone sort of identifies with Horatio. He's like a, a really nice guy who doesn't talk too much, but he's very devoted and loyal. And I think there's this, and I, playing this on stage was such a remarkable experience because he has a lot of good lines, but I just want to read this brief passage at the end of the play, right before Hamlet walks into a big trap and there's a conspiracy to kill him. And, um, mm-hmm. He's on his way to this experience, to this, and the audience is alerted to the conspiracy. They know what's being planned. And right before this event, he says, he says, thou wouldst not believe, he's talking to Horatio, they're alone on stage. Thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart, but it is no matter. Horatio, nay, good my lord, Hamlet, it is but foolery. It is such a kind of gainsgiving as would perhaps trouble a woman. Horatio, if your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit. Hamlet, not a whit. We defy augury. There is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be not now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man of what he leaves knows what is to leave betimes, let be. I just had to share that with you guys because he's really, I think Shakespeare's modeling Hamlet, the first modern man, really, according to Howard Bloom. <laughs> His uh, sense of time, if it be not now, it will be to come. Hmm. It be not to come. I can't even remember what it says. But the readiness is all. If no, since no man of aught he leaves knows what is to leave betimes, let be. Very archaic language there, but I think we still can catch the drift. And I think he, you know, I think he knows what's going to happen, but he allows it to happen. Um, I think he, that was his fate. Um, so anyway, guys, I'm ready to do this. Uh, are you all ready? Yep, sure. Who wants to go first? You already drafted Marco. Marco. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to be... Marco t- agreed. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not now, it's just to come. <laughs> it's to come. <laughs> <laughs> the readiness is all, guys. The readiness is all. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so I'm, I'm, um, think about the past, about yesterday, a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, two decades ago, your beginning. If you can point to that past, point to it. Whereabouts is that past? I can't point to it, John. Uh, would you like me to keep to, to? If you if you can't do that, does it have a size or a shape? Not exactly. What kind of past is that past? The past that I thought about when you asked me to think about it uh, was uh, an, an imagic past. Images of aspects of myself or that I could project back or feel back into. Where, where about Im images? Well, your hand. In, I am because it's, it's sort of in the space within and me, within my uh, awareness, in my body as well. Certainly, I mean, so with feelings in my body. So as I thought about 20 years ago, when I was in college, there was a feeling there. Uh, so, it, Is that your left hand? This is my right hand. So I beg your pardon. That's your right hand. Because my left hand is hope, holding open a page <laughs> from something I wanted to quote earlier. <laughs> I never got around to. I might have used my left hand. This is, both. This is uh, I, I'm it, a, I, I do have an Italian uh, genetics. So okay. <laughs> maybe I, this is a perceptual model. Mm -hmm. It's uh, see, smell, hear, taste, touch. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was looking at that gesture that you're making with your right hand. And I believe your body knows whereabouts this past is. And I think that's where I, well, that's where, as a model, what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, your future, and you, you gave it the size and shape. Mm -hmm. And its images and its mix and its feelings and it was over over there on, on where you were raising your right hand. Mm -hmm. If we were in a room together, it'd be much easier. But I'm use I see this little uh, the square on my screen, so that's what I'm going in. You and the future. Think about the future. Hmm. Whereabouts is that future? Mm -hmm. Does that future have a size or a shape? I'm going to report exactly the image that occurs to me. That's a, of a, a sort of cataract or waterfall or, or some kind of onrushing, and it's coming from above down. That's what it feels like. Above it's, down? Yes, sort of like this. A cataract above mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else about that cataract above down? down it has a circular i'd say arc to it so it would almost be cycling like 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 this uh, cycling uh, right and it, for anyone listening i'm coming from above kind of beyond my head down and through the body kind of out the bottom out into you know the ocean of time space beyond your cycling beyond above beyond your head and into your body right through it i would say through your body mm -hmm. and is there anything else about that future 
cascade, <laughs> circular, above, cyclic, beyond, through. Oh, there's a lot more about it. I'm afraid of going on too much, too long, too much though. Okay. Afraid. Okay. <laughs> Not too much. Hmm? Where is the present? Uh, omni. It's omnipresent. I, I, it's, On omni. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereabouts omni? Sort of uh, different um, planes uh, that are. I, I would course co correlate with senses so you, you said this was perceptual it's interesting because that you say that because something that i've been uh, practicing with uh, in a more explicit way recently has been for lack of a of what, I, what we might call perceptual meditation uh, and i'll i'll just quickly report what i've been doing because it might tie into this it might be, be useful but, of course, there are many different methods of meditation or objects of focus in a meditative type of practice, right? It could be your breath. It could be uh, spaciousness. It could be a mantra, whatever. But uh, what I've been doing is paying attention to the sensory experience. So what do you see? What do you taste? What do you smell? What do you feel? And what, el what else is there? And... So when one does that and brings attention back from a kind of concept or into uh, uh, an imagining, an imagining of an object or imagining of a past, pre past or present or future to what is actually presenting itself through those different sensory uh, channels, I think something different begins to happen there. Can, you, can you indicate the present? Uh, the sensory channels? Uh, again, again, I wouldn't really point to it as a specific location. I would more describe it in terms of flows of information or flows of flows of experience. Flows of information. Mm -hmm. And when flows of information, whereabouts flows of information? Through the through the body, but the, the body is not s simply the, the the physical appearance of, of a of a human, you know, uh, uh, you know, machine or whatever you want to. The, what's interesting about the perceptual process is that it begins the, the, it begins disclosing uh, phenomena that maybe can't be easily categorized as physical or psychic or emotional. It really phenomena are, are coalescences of multiple input streams, multiple multiple information channels. You, you could say so. Anything we you experience has multi dimensions to it that if you open the perceptual lenses allows for a richer object or a richer experience and flows through the body mm -hmm. the richer experience and and sensory lenses and when flows through the body whereabouts flows through the body I'm, I'm moving my hands around in a sort of spiral all around because that's where I sense it. I'm mean, part of my, what I'm trying to practice is sensing beyond my, my body, beyond my perceived body. Okay. And that's okay. Great. Can we pause? Sure. Can we pause that? Mm -hmm. um, that was great. Um, I want you to take paper and make a map of past, present, future in a way that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I hope this um, demonstration sort of, um, it sometimes is kind of messy, and sometimes there's concepts and percepts and something that's in between concept and percept, as I believe we observed in, in Marco and I as we were trying to model his model of the world, his map of time. So I'm inviting this kind of uh, open-ended um, questions about your language, okay? Um, and I thank you for your patience. And while Mark is doing his map, since you've all gotten a, a, a little bit of taste of this, mm -hmm. would someone like to go next?
Okay. TJ. Okay. Think about your past. Think about a month ago, a decade ago, mm -hmm. two decades ago. Keep going. <laughs> to your beginning. And I'm sure for you, you could go beyond the beginning, but. <laughs> um, does your past, uh, whereabouts is that past? Can you indicate that? It's, I guess the best imagery, it, it's a set of concentric circles. And the farther, it's very spatial. This is all very spatial metaphor the farther back in the past i have to reach the farther away the the shell is and it gets closer and more and more distinct as it as it gets closer to me but it's all it's all in this space and like it's all in a bubble around my head <laughs> Where, whereabouts is that bubble around your head can you indicate that within and without within just, and without just around the head space just around the headspace, a bubble. And does that bubble have a size or a shape? Sides, a, a disc of like ripples on the surface of a pond, but um, size, not, not really a size, just more, more, the, more the shape and the wave of it. A disc on the ripples of a pond, a wave? On the surface of a pond. And is there anything else about that wave? To, to anticipate kind of where we've been, it's centered on the present. So it kind of, it travels with me. It travels with you. Yeah, and then uh, images of Doppler shifting and all the rest of it, but yeah. <laughs> and the future, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Think about the future. Does that future have a size or a shape? Always in motion is the future. Motion? <laughs> what kind of motion? The future, curiously enough, is like a... It's not Marco's above downward cataract it's more like a an expanding vortex forward expanding vortex forward how far forward is that expanding vortex it's it goes on for an indefinite and it widens as it goes on and it can be anything. and it go, goes on forward indefinite and widens as widens, it goes forward yeah. and then what happens We'll, we'll know as, as the Doppler moves, you know, along with me further down the cone where it goes. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's, it's very spatial. It's very, very spatially organized. Is, and is there anything else about that future? Yeah, just, just wide enough to remain a set of intriguing possibilities. Thank you. The present, think about the present. And whereabouts is the present? The present is located right behind my forehead, between my eyes. And that's the center of all of this swirling and moving and, you know. And behind the eyes? Right between the eyes, behind between the, the eyes, yeah, behind my forehead, and the center of all the swirling, mm -hmm. and does that center behind the eyes, the center of all that swirling, have a size or a shape? It's a point, and because it's a point. And because kind of past and future meet up and it, it has zero dimensions itself, but it's, it's there. 
a point and past and future meet up. Mm -hmm. And when a point and past and future meet up, is there anything else about that present? No, other than just moving with me in, in that location. Mo you know. Moving with you yeah. in that location. Moving me, moving with me. I move it, you know, it's, it's, it's a connection there. A connection there. Is, is this a good time to pause? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Would you be so kind as to take a, a paper, and make a map of past, present, future in a way that makes sense to you? Okay. Sure. And thank you very much. Thank you. And, you know, we could go on for hours, really. There's so much material here that each of you are offering me. And because of the time constraints here, I have to uh, sort of constrain myself because my curiosity makes me want to go even deeper. Um, so. I, I apologize to so I'm having to organize my time here. Okay, here we go. Ed. Yes, sir. So, you, so you've already had a chance to see our colleagues here, explore mm -hmm. their maps of the yep. time. Are you ready to go? Sure. Great. Think about the past. <laughs> Hmm. Whereabouts is that past? It, it's in different places. Sometimes I see it out of the corner of my eye. Which corner of which eye? It can be either eye. So either corner. Sometimes it's in front of me or behind me. Sometimes, I'll use the, the metaphor, sometimes the past sneaks up on me from behind. Ah. Sometimes it confronts me head on. Um, and then again, sometimes it's merely a peripheral apparition of sorts. In, in a corner of your eye, mm -hmm. either eye, yeah. front, behind, and past sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. And what determines front, behind? When past sneaks up on you. I can feel it there. Feel it there? Whereabouts there? Behind me. Ah, okay. Yeah. I feel it behind me. Huh? And you it's feel like it. Someone looking over your shoulder kind of thing. And you feel it as a person looking over your shoulder. Yeah. When behind you, mm -hmm. and you feel it there, does it have a size or a shape? Uh, no shape. No shape. It um, it takes shape. It takes shape. It takes shape, and the shape depends on what it is that that's coming. Um, you, know, you were saying perceptually. I'm, I usually don't smell things from like the past, but um, increasingly, I encounter smells or aromas, and they trigger past things. So it's. Can stimulate. I don't. I don't smell my way in, but a smell can bring it. Bring it on. It, and a smell can bring it on. Oh yeah. And is there a smell that can bring it on when behind you and feel and there's no there's no shape. There's mm -hmm. no size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there anything else about smell when the past triggers? Uh, mo no. Most most of them are. Most of them are actually very pleasant. There's uh, there's a few smells that I've I've had lately where it it triggered let's say a, a, a pleasant memory, and there was also smells that have triggered what were actually not so pleasant memories that weren't so bad as memories. Uh -huh. You know, the experience was a lot worse than the memory. Then. Okay. And very and very pleasant. Yeah. Thank you. And. The future. Think about the future. Mm -hmm. And when think about the future, whereabouts is that future? Well, it's just like the past. It kind of like pops up all over the place. It, it, it's like the past and it pops up. Yeah, all it pops up all over the place. You know, to, to localize, sometimes it's in front of me. 
you know, sometimes it comes up behind me. Sometimes and, I see it out of the corner of my eye, you know, get a glimpse of something, I'll turn my head. You know. and, and when it pops up, mm-hmm. and you know it's the future, whereabouts pops up? That's depending on whether where I feel it or see it. So, you know, I don't see things behind me as much as I see things like out here in my peripheral field of vision. And like when I'm, when you well, it depends on whether you see or feel it. Or feel, yeah, yeah. And when you see or feel it, and it pops up, and it's in front of you. Mm-hmm. Does that have a size or a shape? No, it's again that it takes shape. It, it takes it, it takes shape depending on what it is that that I happen to be encountering. You know, I, I might I might see a picture of myself, or I might I might have a particular feeling about something. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. And the present. Mm-hmm. Think about the present. Whereabouts is the present? Uh, it's more hidden than the other two. <laughs> more hidden. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of wake up to it uh, more than more than I sense it. You know? And I realize, well, I'm I'm here doing this right now, and it's uh, um, happens a lot when I'm cooking. Oh. I, yeah, I realize I'm standing at the stove and I'm I'm making lunch. Or well, we just had Thanksgiving. I'm. I had to do Thanksgiving. I do Thanksgiving dinner all by myself for the 10 people that are there. And and that's a very present moment for me, for example. And when present, mm-hmm. is there anything else about that present? It's very enlivening. Very enlivening. Enlivening. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the word. And because it's got all of it, it's got sights, it's got smells, there's sounds, there's things clapping, you know, people are running in and out looking for stuff and asking questions. It's a, it's a very dynamic kind of present, that one. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. And take a, take a paper. Okay. Make a map of past, present, future in a way that makes sense to you. Okie dokie. Thank you. Thank and you. So, so is it okay if you look at your map, Marco? Can you share that with us? How is everybody? Is everyone on the – you're relaxed and alert and everything? Okay. A rich learning experience. It is. This is good. Yeah, I'm, about this movie. Well, I'm not obviously a, a visual artist. Uh, yeah, a lot better than me. Better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to describe various circles. Is, you know, so there's a sort of human figure in the middle, maybe a meditator. So you see the head, body, and the kind of circle around where the legs would be. And then you see the currents coming through from above, down, and from below up. And these, uh, you know, other cycles kind of uh, more circling the uh, entity. Uh, But almost gyroscopically, if you would imagine that, the... Spherically, perhaps, would be another way of looking at it, but not a simple sphere, a complex sphere with multiple channels within it or um, currents uh, that are circumnavigating it. Some of this may be influenced by my recent reading. But I've divided the paper up into past, present, and future with the present in the middle and really uh, uh, the band covering the body. So everything happening in the body present is present oriented i put the future above and that's corresponding to what i described earlier as the cascade or the current coming down and then i put the past below which i would associate with origin in, in, the, in the gibsarian sense as well in insofar as it it's never presence and it's a it's more of a darkness because the deeper down you go into it, the, the the less precisely perceptible phenomena are. And currents and multiple channels and future above, present in the middle, mm-hmm. past below. 
mm-hmm. and darkness. Mm-hmm. And with all of that, what are you most drawn to? Well, I'm drawn to the circulation because you don't see it on the paper, but if you were to extend these lines outwards, they would all circle around and come back. And so that, that's what I'm exploring is how exactly that works. And, you know, how is it that time is not just a, a linear back, you know, middle and forward uh, type of experience, but is one that recurs and cycles and, and also has some emergent quality to it because this, this sense of an emergence, the sense of a blossoming or of a unfolding a uh, revelation, uh, that is part of what part of the experience I believe, uh, and not just that I believe. That's part of what I'm experiencing. And emergence and blossoming and unfolding and revelation. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? <laughs> that's a good question. That's 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 a great question. Uh, that's, that's I think part of what is uh, so enticing about the process is that. There, there is an indeterminacy to what emerges. It's not predictable in a, in a you know, rationalistic manner. It, it's a surprise. It's meant to be a surprise. If we knew what it was, then there, we would, there wouldn't be a point necessarily to the, to the experience. Is it okay if we pause? Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, who goes in? TJ? And we're all going to look at everyone's map, and then we're going to open it up to a, a, what do you call it, free-for-all, all-over-the-place sort of summary, okay? Just to let you know what the pace is. So we're at 4.30. Is that okay? Are we over over our time? Or is it... We're over. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Yeah, you, guys we, we, you know, we've been tending to go over the last... We'll so I, I, I think 20 more minutes. Will we have 20 minutes to do this? Yes, and that, that's actually all I have because I have another appointment okay. at the top of the hour. I'll, be, I'll try to be mindful of that. Thank you. Okay, TJ? I don't know if you can see it. Did I write that dark enough? I can see it. Ooh. Yes, that's perfect. Okay. So, like I said, we just kind of have this pool of memories that's represented as the past, focused on a present moment, and then expanding out into a future. And I kind of, I don't know if I put the swirls in there. Um, Just like the past memories, you know, some are sharper than others, some are not. And then the future is, is not, is not a deterministic. There's a linear and spatial aspect of this whole model, but it's not, you know, I don't know which direction this future is actually, you know, going to take. And like Marco said, what would be the point if I did? So. What are you most drawn to? The fact that I, because I'm moving, this is, this is two dimensional. So this is actually, it should be forward. I put forward as up. And the fact that I'm kind of taking the swirling of the past with me into the future as I go as part of the swirl, just, you know, thinking about things and how they affect other things is, is part of it. The connectivity of it all. Connectivity. You know, I mean, we're, I'm saying past, present, and future, but it's just really it's all it's all connected and it all it all influences i I take the influences with me as i travel which is why it kind of ripples out behind me and and cones and vortexes in front thank you very much i I regret and of course this is what you said about time ed we never have enough of it because i really wish (laughs) speaking of time (laughs) there's so much richness there i'd like to tease out um Mm. but anyway Moving on to Ed, do you have your map? Can you show us? I have a map. Okay, right. cool. I don't. I don't know where's the best place to put this that you can see it. I can see uh, it. That's good. That's, yeah, that's good. Okay. So, what what I have in there is the uh, three to X, Y, and Z axes. The they're in different colors, which you won't be able to discern as much. But so imagine a three three dimensional coordinate system. Since Sean was asking a lot about locations, and these these past events that appear are in green and the present ones are circled peas and the futures are the red and some of them have rays of light because they're visual some of them have a heart because it's a feeling i have some of them have those little uh, 
wiggly lines to go up because there would be smells perhaps or tastes involved and, and that kind of thing. And, and then, and then they're kind of like dotted or dashed lines connecting various events because it's not sometimes a past, a memory will come that will trigger a thought about today or maybe even something about the future. And sometimes I see things, I, not like I see things in the future. I'm not a visionary, believe me. Um, but there are like potentials that could come to be. You're not a visionary? No, no I don't consider myself. I one. don't believe you. Because <laughs> <laughs> that map looks like the map of a visionary to me. <laughs> Pardon me, that wasn't a good <laughs> I'm having trouble calling it a map. But, <laughs> but anyway, because, and that's, that's this whole thing. They just kind of like pop up. And then they're there, and then I can follow it for a while, and then you know they'll they'll, they'll become more intense. Um, things in the past when the visual tend to be more black and white. Uh huh. Um, in the past, more black and white. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, my, my. This is also a, a follow on because my children think I grew up in a Technicolor childhood because it was 1950s, and I thought everything was black and white back then, <laughs> and it was actually very, very disturbingly black and white. No. <laughs> I didn't see a color TV until I was like 14 years old. So wow. uh, that kind of thing. But but anyhow, that that's how my map kind of functions. It's it, it's it's kind of there and it's not and yeah, you know, we, we kind of go with what's there. Right. Yeah. Is it okay if we pause? Sure, sure. Oh yeah. Thank you very much guys. I'm just gonna turn on the light because it's getting dark here. Okay. Um so we, we finished this, this uh, modeling process, and I hope it was useful. Um, it was certainly useful for me. Mm. It's a big challenge, um, but I think it's very important as we um, – I have my model of the world or my map. Mm. You, each of you have your map. And the research question is, I can't know anything about our map unless I know what your map is. Mm. You know what my map is. And then what emerges out of that investigation? And I'm very interested in the phenomenological investigation um, because we can come up with meta theories and string theory and off we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but as we've all expressed a concern about, um, you know, how we're going to work with this. Um, so it's an open question. And so I'm really curious about if there's anything that you learned today from this process that you would like to share with the group, I would be very grateful. So maybe we could just go around and ask, uh, is there anything you learned from this, this process or this conversation today? Time's not simple. All of our maps have, have a dynamism to them. Yeah. 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 Time's not simple. And each, all of our maps have a dynamism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is I mean, my, I, like especially I was coming, I know I'm coming from a, where the historian comes from and it's real, you know, a very linear and arrow, but even that is a swirling mess of all kinds of images and, and things. A swirling mess. <laughs> <laughs> is yeah. there, uh, Marco, Ed, would you like to share something you learned today? Oh, oh, beg your pardon. Can I go back to TJ? Mm -hmm. Is there, I'm going to ask you, is there an action that you can take that will honor this learning? You don't have to come up with the right way. I'm just mm -hmm. asking this like an assignment. Mm -hmm. Could you yeah. come up come with an action? That. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask each of you to find a learning and come up with an action. If you can come up with an action, you can share it online or between now and our next event, I think we could start to then um, open ourselves up to evidence. You know, can we work with serendipity and synchronicity? Because you know, all kinds of things can happen between now and the next time we, we have a con infinite conversation. So that's my logic here. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a paraconsistent logic because we're mm -hmm. dealing with a, a mess. <laughs> I, I don't have a specific action, but it is going to deal with you, you brought up how how do we construct it um, collective maps without and that's kind of my whole thing about cultural configurations and and time and everything. So it's gonna it's along those lines. I don't know exactly what the action 
is yet. But well, I'd be very grateful if you yeah. you don't know what that action is, but if you could yeah, intend, to ha intend to find an action, not to solve the world's problems, but just to have a, an action that honors what you've learned. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think that Gibbs would call that concrescence. So I think that's what yep. concrescence. I think that's what he means. Huh? Yeah. Anybody else have a learning, Marco or or Ed? I, I found it an extremely challenging exercise to because I don't think I don't really think about time all that much spatially. You know, I understand the arrow thing, and I really like the circle thing of the magical and mystical, but. And sometimes it's like that and sometimes it isn't. So this was, for me, a very stimulating exercise to try to put into a spatialized map, because i got to draw it on a two-dimensional piece of paper, something that isn't actually suited to a two-dimensional piece of paper. That, that, was a, that's, that was a challenge for me. But then drawing anything is a challenge for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's why i said make a map this yeah i know i know you said make a map or a diagram or sketch you know? <laughs> <laughs> and if and once again if you could come up with a learning yeah okay uh, I, I wrote that down i figured you were going to pass that on that was getting off the hook because i'm aware of t i'm aware of the time frame here i know you have to do something marco so i want to respect your you, you have to run and do that but if you can come up with something you learned today? Would you like to share? Are you, are you asking me? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, I thought Ed needed to have an action. Uh, I, I, I wrote down that today. I need to yeah. come oh, up okay. with an action. So your I action is to come up with an action. Well, that, that can be I'm, I'm the slow guy. I'm the old guy, I'm the slowest, okay? That's a follow-up <laughs> from this next okay. If you want to participate. <laughs> Oh man, uh, I, this is so odd for me. I have to say, because I'm obsessed by space and time. <laughs> like when I have free time and personal space, mm -hmm. I spend that time and I occupy that space, contemplating the space and time itself. So, and, and through, and that that is a theme in that I in my poetry, what I write about what I read about. And like I said, like when I'm alone, that's where my mind tends to go is into what's actually, what's re really happening here. What's the dimensionality of this? How does this all work? And so I'm, I'm constantly kind of a little bit out of step with consensus reality. <laughs> and, <laughs> You're not missing anything. <laughs> 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 uh, that, that interplay between sort of what I am sent, what I sense is more true, and or how it might be more true, and then what appears to be kind of the way that things work or the, the way that things are operationalized, the gap between what could be operationalized, which isn't, and what is operationalized that really shouldn't be, uh, is sort of the, where the tension is, I think, and where my field of action would be. And right now, my most important action, and this is not new, but it's new to the conversation, is to stay present and to keep paying attention. Uh, and particularly with my body, particularly with the, the, the sensory channels and the information flows, it's becoming, I'm, I'm, I'm more and more acutely aware of the limitations um, that are, and, and, where, and where they might be coming from. And I, I, th I think sensitive to how I could to loosen those up a bit, open open up a bit more. I think that there's a lot that I'm just missing because I'm because of the body itself, it, out of habit, out of pattern, out of defense, out of fear, out of you know post -trauma, tra trauma, whatever number of other factors is more constricted than it really needs to be. It could be more open. There could be a more more throughput, if you will, of the these these multi dimensional information flows. And you can't just go from closed to open immediately because this, there's a structural aspect to it. And that's that the structures themselves have to be able to uh, endure the, those flows. If they can't, then, the, the, then the, the being will be kind of messed up by, by it. And so uh, that's the, an ongoing learning is I think all, all I could say about that. And I'm aware as well that I probably need some help 
<laughs> that uh, I can't do it all by myself sitting in my room here. Mm. I, I wanted to add something. Um, I didn't get to ask this question, um, but maybe next time we can do a clean start where I could like ask each person, what kind of support mm. do you need? Mm. Or what resources do you have that you want to, re to develop? Because I think that's very important um, that we get the support that we need. Um, and I know I need a lot of support. And what I want, and I wanted to, this may be for a future discussion, but I think the, or conversation, uh, and the idea of um, action plans, where I think uh, we've, we have resistance to them if we've been terribly disappointed by actions that we've taken, they've fallen apart. <clears throat> so we don't, we don't make any plans. <clears throat> um, I think that's part of the postmodern drift. And I'm um, very resistant to that myself because probably I've been disappointed so many times. And I'm sort of saying, you know, I, I don't want to do this action plan that um, a lot of our time management courses are, are in, you know, and I'm really into finding an action that honors the learning. It could be a gesture, it could be a dance, it could be lots of different things, um, but it's much more of a, a can you create a ritual? Um, and for me, I just was aware as I was listening to all, all the different kind of learnings here. I really want to, I want to make a Klein bottle. I know I can do a Mobius strip. That's pretty easy. I could even do a limnoscape. You know, once you make the Mobius strip, all you have to do is cut it down the middle and it turns into a limnoscape. Um, but I think I sort of need to, to craft a, to make a Klein bottle. It doesn't have, doesn't even have to be, you know, it could be made out of cardboard. So that's my um, commitment. That's the action that I want to take that will honor the learning that I've enjoyed today with all of you guys. Deep bows to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. No, thank you, John. That was uh, a yeah. very stimulating experience again. Huh? Yeah. And I'm looking forward to to, re, to viewing this video when you post it, Marco, because then I can start going to a meta level. Yeah. Because I'm sure there's so much that happened that I was totally missing. All right. Well, I'll post it as soon as I can. All right. Colorado All right. time, of course. <laughs> what, whatever that is. How poor are they that have not patience? <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. Take care. Take care. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Till next time, huh? Yep. <laughs>